Okay, please allow me to introduce our distinguished uh, guest today. And gentlemen, when I call your name, you just give a wave. Um, on my left, I have Mr. Doug Bank, uh, Mr. Richard Marowitz, Mr. Al Cohen, and Mr. Ray Keach. Uh, the first three gentlemen are from the Albany area, and Mr. Keach lives in Hudson Falls, and they're all survivors of the Battle of the Bulge. And today they're here to tell us their stories. So if you could please get the lights for me, Matt. Yeah. We're going to see a slideshow presentation on the Battle of the Bulge. <clears throat> Very brief. And then uh, we'll let these gentlemen take it from there. Towards quarter of one, we'll stop. And uh, you can come up and meet our veterans and ask some questions, etc. So without further ado, the Battle of the Bulge, December 16, 1944. January 25th, 1945. Scene, the morning of December 16th, 1944. A lonely outpost on the Belgian frontier. Quote, Hell came in like a freight train. I heard an explosion and went back to where my friend was. His legs were blown off. He bled to death in my arms. It involved over a million men, 600,000 Americans, half a million Germans, 55,000 British. 81,000 U.S. soldiers were casualties, with 19,000 killed, depending on the source that you look at. 100,000 Germans were killed, wounded, or captured. And 1,400 uh, British were wounded or killed. In France, in the bitter cold of winter, the morning of December 16, 1944, five months after the Allied landings at Normandy, the German army launched an all-out surprise counterattack against thinly held American lines in the Ardennes Forest. So began what Winston Churchill called the greatest American battle of the Second World War and the most terrible, costly battle ever fought by Americans in any war. And here we see a map um, showing the Allied landings and the positions just before the Battle of the Bulge and the ground that they held, having liberated France. And it was, we were poised to strike into the heartland of Germany. Three powerful German armies, over 2,500 men, caught the advancing Americans off guard and counterattacked through the heavily forested Ardennes region of Belgium and Luxembourg. The last major German offensive of the war, it caught American military commanders by surprise, and this is a map that shows the pocket, hence the name, the Bulge, the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, I'll go back to this map later if uh, we need to look at it. But, yeah. The Battle of the Balls, December 16, 1944, uh, it lasts for over a month. Hitler's goal was to reach the sea and drive a wedge between the Allies to force a negotiated peace settlement. Here we see a German soldier. So huge and critical was the battle that in Washington, Roosevelt met with the Secretary of War and the officer in charge of the Manhattan Project to discuss using the still untried atomic bomb against the Germans if Hitler's offensive could not be stopped on the ground. As it was, more than half a million American troops were on the move, and more than any other one factor, it was the ordinary American foot soldier who determined the outcome. Many were barely out of high school, 18, 19 years old. Uh, many had never seen combat. Okay. It was the coldest, snowiest winter in recent European memory. American infantrymen during the counterattack endured sub-zero temperatures, howling winds, and long brutal nights in the Ardennes forest. And here's a photograph of the paratroopers, the 101st Airborne, uh, burying their dead the day after Christmas. On January 29th, during the counterattack to push the Germans back into Germany, winter warfare. And men of the 325th Lighter Infantry There was no ceremony to mark the end of the battle, not even a headline. The GIs simply kept moving forward into Germany. And this sign was posted by American GIs entering Germany later, later on. Give me five years and you will not recognize Germany again. A quote from one of Hitler's speeches, election speeches, uh, in the 1930s. And how prophetic it proved to be. And today, to share their experiences with us, we have... Uh, Doug Venk, who was a tank gunner, later a tank commander during the Battle of the Bulge and elsewhere. 
uh, Mr. Al Cohen, who was an infantry rifleman and a guard at the Nuremberg War Tri Tribunals. We're going to hear from him later on. And uh, Richard Marowitz, infantryman, reconnaissance and intelligence. He also helped deliberate the Dachau death camp, and he searched Hitler's Munich home the day after for evidence. And uh, they're here today to share their stories. And uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to Doug. Can I have the lights, please? And I'll let Doug take it from here. Good afternoon. First, I want to thank you for having us back here. Uh, we were here two years ago, but we had nothing like this. Um, first, I want to say that what you hear from us, don't take it that we condone war, because we don't. War doesn't solve any problems. It just causes more for the next conflict that you get into. I happen to be shipped over to England in uh, May of 1944. I had spent 14 months in the States in basic training with the 8th Armored Division. From there I went over and I joined uh, the 6th Armored Division when they come out of uh, Brest and uh, I met them at St. Lo. When we got to uh, the period of getting into the uh, Ardennes, the temperature there at that time was anywhere from 30 to 40 degrees, degrees below zero every day. Winds were blowing, snow was up to your hips. And I will say here, if it wasn't for the infantry and the paratroopers that had been uh, trapped in Bastogne, none of us would be here today. I don't know how they did it. I was lucky enough to be inside of a tank, which gets kind of cold because it's all cast iron. Nothing like the new ones today. What happened was, uh, on the uh, 15th of uh, December, 1944, the Germans were still behind our lines on our own home ground before they broke out. When they broke out, they came in 85 miles. They made a, a push of 85 miles into the territory that we were occupying. The reason that the uh, they got overrun is that a month before Bastogne or, or the Ardennes, a month before they, these outfits had fought in the Hurricane Forest and they got decimated. They almost got annihilated. So our government got the bright idea that the Ardennes was kind of quiet, be a good place to put them into rest and re refit them out. Well, our people didn't decide that uh, after listening to refugees coming through, uh, Eisenhower and, and uh, Bradley, the general, decided that uh, Hitler wouldn't come through there. He'd come through there uh, when they occupied France, and the German, over the years, they had used it twice before. Well, it proved wrong, because that's where they came through. Uh, people were telling, uh, the refugees were telling about uh, Hitler building up this massive army, which he did. How he got, I don't know how he got all his equipment, but uh, he came up with something like 20 divisions to come through there. Just before uh, they came through, they sent 2,000 English-speaking German soldiers who spoke perfect English. They came in in jeeps, they cut all communication lines, they turned all the road signs around, so in case we did get moving again, we'd be going the wrong direction. At 5.30 that morning, on the 16th, something like 1,900 artillery pieces opened up, and they shelled the hell out of them. Everybody that was there. Uh, they drove most of the troops were driven back into the town of Bastogne, where they were completely surrounded by German troops. Nothing could get in, nothing could get out. Uh, they couldn't make any uh, airdrops. The weather was too bad for the plane to fly. What happened later on was these, these troops really fought 
And it came to the point where, I don't know if any of you have seen the uh, movies of Battleground, stuff like that, where it showed a, a German tank corps trying to find our fuel dump. And uh, if you did see that movie, it was all Hollywood because it didn't turn out that way. They had a tank commander in charge, of, or a tank general in charge of a panzer group, which is what we call a tank group, a tank division. His name was Piper. His job was to go and try to find fuel, because they were so far from Germany, from their own lines, that they couldn't uh, supply themselves fast enough. So he went to break out, and he went to a town called Stadlot, which is on that map. Can you shut the first bank of lights off? Can you bring Stadlot is up in here. In the meantime, right there is Stadlot. What happened before that was that when they captured our prisoners, they took them up to this town of Malmody. They told them to all get out of the trucks and they were going to have a rest period. They got out of the trucks and then machine gunned them all to death. That's why that was the massacre of Malmody and that's why you'll find today that everybody you talked to that was there, it didn't uh, dampen our uh, enthusiasm. It made us more mad and uh, that's why I think most of us uh, could stay and fight that thing. Hey, Doug. Yeah, those uh, Americans, just to clarify, they'd surrendered before they were machine gunned by the Germans. Oh, yeah. True? They were surrendered and captured when they came to uh, They were the first troops captured when the Germans came in. And they took them up to Malmody and uh, machine gunned them all. How we know is that uh, I think a couple got through. And that's how we knew about that. But anyway, Piper took off from here. And he went out trying to find our uh, fuel dump. He got the stop lot. He, he captured that in the morning and we took it back at night. If he had gone up here to Spa, which was one mile away from where he stopped, there was 2.5 million gallons of fuel sitting in our fuel dump there. If he got that, that was the end of us. Consequently, he ran out of gas. All the tanks, they just left the tanks, they got out and they walked back to Germany. That was one of the big turning points of that. But uh, other than that, um, it was, oh, I didn't arrive into uh, to, uh, Bastogne until the 26th of December because my outfit then was fighting down in the, uh, by the Thar River. And we had to wait to get relieved. And it just is in the daytime where you call somebody and they relieve you. You have to wait till they're done with their battle and you come in and do your work. So we were sent to, they uh, had a meeting in uh, Verdun with Bradley, uh, Eisenhower, Montgomery from England, and uh, the famous General Patton, old blood and guts. They wanted to find out how they could get a unit through to break through with the Bastogne and relieve the ones that trapped there. Well, Patton, with his big mouth, which he did have, he had a very big mouth, but he, he was about the only general that knew what he was doing. He said, you give me two empty divisions and an armored division, and I'll be there in two days. And they all said it was impossible, but they gave him the 2 MP division, the armored division, which happened to be the 6th armor that I was with. We went across what they call the Skyline Highway. There's nothing but snow, sleet, and rain. And you're going across way up in the air like this. And we have steel tracks on you. So consequently, every time you went to move, you were sliding. We slid down the road most of the way. We got there in two days. We busted in, we come in from the south and busted in and we leave them. The 4th Armored was in there at that time. 
But like I say, if it wasn't for him running out of fuel, that would have been the turning point of the war in their favor. So now that I've said that much, I'll turn it over to Rich or Al, whoever wants to say something. Thanks, Doc. Um, I got over uh, around Thanksgiving time, 1944. Um, Green went over with Task Force Linden, which was actually a 42nd Rainbow Division. Um, it was called a task force because it was just the three infantry regiments. The rest of the division, all the support, um, artillery and armor and all that other good stuff, didn't come over until February 17th in 1945. Um, that caused a considerable amount of uh, confusion because a lot of people think that the Rainbow Division didn't go over until 19. Uh, 1945, February 17th, not realizing that Task Force Linden was the 42nd Division. We were all green. We had the um, good basic training, so most of us did. Um, and we came over, landed in Marseille, France, and were sent up to the front um, around Christmas time. Um, then we were put on a uh, quiet front. See, what they do is they teach you how to fire your weapons and um, read the compass and uh, stay alive to a certain extent. And then you go to a quiet front to learn how to put all of that into practice. Uh, so theoretically, you really don't know a heck of a lot when you get, on this, uh, get up to the front. And since we were totally green, including our officers, um, um, we uh, were quite surprised when that uh, quiet front turned out to be not so quiet. Um, uh, at that point, or shortly after that, I volunteered for the uh, uh, INR platoon, Intelligence and Reconnaissance, which is considered hazardous duty. It's a small platoon. We were attached to headquarters company of the 222nd Regiment. Um, when I say hazardous, I mean that we had a 75% turnover in our platoon, which is kind of heavy. I was a scout, point scout on the point jeep. There were seven jeeps, 28 men, four men to a jeep. Um, and uh, what a point scout does is when you get to a village or a clump of woods or some good stuff like that, you, um, uh, the two point scouts get out of the jeep, walk into the woods or the village, and if they don't get killed, you wave the rest of the guys in. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, Larry Hancock and myself were quite lucky. Um, we generally did not work full strength. Generally, we worked in two squads, three jeeps, 12 men, uh, traveling parallel roads. The, the uh, seventh jeep contained the um, platoon sergeant, um, peaked the medic. Uh, we had our own medic because uh, the rest of the guys back at regiment really didn't need them. They had the aid station. And, um, and the driver and a radio man. And the eighth jeep was uh, our lieutenant, Lieutenant Short, who was the commander of our little group. And um, uh, he had a driver and a radio man and a guy on a 50 caliber machine gun in his jeep. Um, and he generally kept in contact with the two squads. Um, and our mission generally was to find the enemy and report back. We got lost one day and enabled the regiment to advance 35 miles in one day. And we were so stupid that we actually did that, which put us out on a finger and the Germans were ready to cut us off. 
Uh, so we had to get back anyway. Um, and um, when, um, unfortunately, when you find, the, sometimes you find the Germans before they find you, but in other times they find you before you find them. That's what makes it hazardous. Um, we were the first in Dachau, we were the first in Munich, um, and um, um, we were first every place we went. And that was the reason for the uh, extreme turnover in our platoon. That gives you a pretty good idea what I did for a living while I was in the infantry. Now I'll let Al tell you a little bit about what he did. I started out, <clears throat> I was drafted in, when I was 18. Prior to that, I enlisted in the Coast Guard when I was 17. After a short time, I received a medical discharge. I wasn't supposed to uh, go into service. And through a mistake at the draft board, when I was 18, they drafted me, and I wanted to go. Uh, I took basic training as a rifleman in Little Rock, Arkansas, Camp Joseph T. Robinson. And after my 17 weeks, which I was lucky to get, the ball started, and I shipped out to Fort Meade, Maryland, and then board a ship and landed in La Havre, France, the beginning of January. Uh, the weather, as Rich said and Doug, uh, was cold, snowing. Uh, we went up to the Italian headquarters of the 90th Division, it was in the 359th Infantry. They wanted volunteers for heavy weapons. Heavy weapons consisted of either 81 millimeter mortars or water-cooled 30 caliber machine guns. Uh, so there was 15 of us that buddied around on the ship going over, and a couple of them decided they were going to volunteer for the mortar platoon. They figured they'll be in the back of the line, and it'll be safer. So we all knew each other, so the 15 of us volunteered. Instead of getting in the mortar platoon, they put us in the machine gun platoon. We got up to the company and then the platoon. There were three men left out of 65 men. The next morning there was one man left. And the 15 of us ran the three, gun, three or four guns. Uh, I started out carrying ammunition. One man would carry ammunition, uh, one man carried the tripod for the machine gun, the other one carried the machine gun, the first gunner, or second gunner, rather. Uh, as we got more men, we had more men to carry ammunition. By process of elimination, you moved up the line. It became second gunner and then first gunner. Uh, the weather, the weather, it was cold, uh, cold wasn't the word, freezing. Uh, you, uh, you had to dig, you dig the gun in. You couldn't dig into the ground. It was all frozen. You just scooped out a place in the snow, and uh, there was no place to get warm. Uh, the clothing was inac uh, inaccurate for us. What I'm wearing is what we we had uh, beside a set of long underwear, a shirt, pants, a sweater, and a field jacket. Uh, luckily, I picked up a, uh, a rabbit skin vest someplace along the line, and that was a lifesaver. At least it kept me warm. Uh, the medics carried blood plasma. They had to carry it inside their shirts next to their body so it wouldn't freeze. Um, we carried uh, a radio man, carried a 300 radio, it's a backpack radio, and it used a battery, you know, maybe about this size or a little bit larger, and the cold weather cut the, the battery life on it, 
So we'd help the radio man, we'd carry a couple of spare batteries, we'd car have to carry that next to our body also to keep them from freezing. Uh, we didn't get any hot meals. We ate canned rations. This is one part of the rations. Came in cans like this. Uh, the breakfast, breakfast unit had uh, powdered coffee in it. You couldn't light a fire, so you couldn't have any hot coffee or anything hot. Uh, the dinner unit, whoever designed it, put lemon extract in there for lemonade. You didn't need lemonade when the weather was below zero. And the dinner unit, if you were lucky to get one, was the same way. Um, things went along. Uh, little by little, we'd get a replacement. One replacement to, would come up. You'd get him. The supply sergeant would come around with, uh, he'd have maybe a field jacket, maybe a set of long underwear, a couple of pair of socks, and we had to draw straws for it. There wasn't enough to go around. The, uh, else. Al, how old were you, Al? I was 19 then. You were 19 years old. And then when I was 18, I went overseas. I was just 19. Can I uh, have students come up and uh, take a look at some of these things now? Rations and such? This. The last time I had a, a, took a shower was on the ship going over, and I don't know if anyone ever took a uh, took a shower aboard a ship. Uh, the water isn't too purified, and the soap is like sandpaper. bathed out of a helmet. This is a steel pot. You bathed out of this. If you wanted to heat water, you put it on the fire. You heated water. Uh, once in a while, when we, when we got into Germany, we'd be attached to a rifle squad. And usually we drew the same rifle squad. And one fellow would be designated as the cook. Another one would look for potatoes in the farmhouse. Another one would go chasing a chicken down the road and would try and make some kind of a meal. And that's the way it went until we got into Germany and the weather started to uh, ease up. Uh, thanks, Al. Yeah, I got a couple of minutes before the class changed. I got about five minutes. Broadcasting live from Hudson Falls High School, first and foremost. My name is Mr. Rozelle. I teach history here. Um, for those of you who are watching in other school buildings or anywhere around the country, we're broadcasting live on the World Wide Web. And these stories that we're going to hear today are going to be archived, archived and transcribed, and they're going to be available at our website, which uh, hopefully you know if you're listening to me, you're on it. So we are going to begin just by reintroducing our veterans. Uh, these gentlemen survived uh, the Battle of the Bulge. They pushed into Germany towards the end of the war in uh, April and May of 1945, and they're here to tell us their stories today. Um, so I'd just like to uh, introduce the gentleman once more, and if you could, gentlemen, just give a wave of the hand when I say your name. Mr. Doug Bank, uh, Mr. Richard Merowitz, Mr. Al Cohen, and Mr. Ray Keach. And uh, we're really happy to have them with us today. Okay, I need lights, Matt. Okay, the second segment is going to deal with what happened after the GIs made it across the Rhine River and into the uh, German heartland. Things that they saw, the things that they witnessed, and uh, one of them, obviously, if you look at the screen, was the liberation of a death camp called Dachau. And as I go through this slideshow presentation, keep in mind the pictures that you see uh, we're from these camps, and multiply this one camp by several hundred, and you get a, just a 
small picture of what really happened. There's people today, 60 years after the event, who will tell you that the Holocaust didn't happen. And as this generation that's with us today passes from the earth, the eyewitnesses, the people who were there, the people who saw it, that story is going to get easier and easier to believe, and that's the purpose for uh, our shows. And without further ado, we'll begin. The Liberation of Dachau. April 29, 1945. Work makes one free. From the German. This appeared on the entrance to many of these death camps where political prisoners and Jews would be led through for the last times. And this is from the main gate at Dachau Prison. When the Americans arrived in the last week of April 1945, these are some of the things that they saw. It says, an American soldier feeds a liberated camp prisoner intravenously. Dachau, May 7, 1945. The place was a monument to the darkest side of man, and yet, despite the smoke and ash that rained down on their homes from camp incinerators, despite the sickly smell of burning flesh and hair, which surely carried with the slightest breeze, as far away as probably as Munich, about a dozen miles away. The villagers claimed they hadn't known. As Allied forces advanced towards Germany, the Germans began to move prisoners from concentration camps near the front to prevent the liberation of large numbers of prisoners. Transports from the evacuated camps arrived continuously at Dachau, resulting in a dramatic deterioration of conditions, not that conditions were wonderful to begin with. After days of travel, with little food or no water, the prisoners arrived weak and exhausted near death. On April 26, 1945, as American forces approached, there were 67,665 registered prisoners in Dachau and the subcamps. Of these, 43,350 were categorized as political prisoners, while 22,100 were Jews. This plaque is on the gatehouse wall of Dachau, and it says, in honor of the 42nd Rainbow Division and other U.S. 7th Army Liberators of Dachau Concentration Camp, April 29, 1945, and in everlasting memory of the victims of Nazi barbarism, this tablet is dedicated May 3, 1992. And uh, Richard Marowitz, who was there at Dachau, helped liberate it on the 29th of April uh, was in this 42nd Rainbow Division, and he's going to tell you a little bit about it in a minute. Go ahead. As they neared the camp, American soldiers found more than 30 railroad carts filled with the bodies brought to Dachau, all of them in an advanced state of decomposition, and this photograph was taken there. Boxcars and nearby railway siding yard were also found filled with hundreds of corpses. Here's a quote from a communique from General Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander. Our forces liberated and mopped up the infamous concentration camp at Dachau. Approximately 32,000 prisoners were liberated. 300 SS camp guards were quickly neutralized. Translation. Here's a photograph of what fate the guards had waiting for them. Okay. It says, decontamination rooms for the clothing removed from the dead located at the extreme western end of the crematorium building on the 30th of April. These are some of the Polish prisoners who were liberated. Here's a sample of some of the people who were liberated that day by the Americans. <coughs> And this graphic gives you an idea, if you can see it, each dot represents a quote-unquote detention center. Slave labor, death camp, and uh, this is in Germany and its surrounding areas where it was conquered. Go ahead. And if you get a little closer, it says, Greater Germany, Major Nazi Camps, 1944. This would have been a few months before the liberation year or so. 
Doc, I was down here. In the southern part of Germany. Dachau prisoner salutes American 7th Army soldiers after the liberation. I thought this photograph was uh, very telling of the joy that was in these people's hearts, naturally. Okay. Can I have the lights, please? And at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to the people who are there, and I'm going to start with Richard because Richard was a member of the 42nd Rainbow Division who drove up to the camp gates on the 29th of April, 1945, and I think he's going to tell you a little bit about what he witnessed. <clears throat> on the, excuse me, on the 29th of April, 1945, uh, my platoon was called into the command post. <clears throat> we were in a little village, I don't remember the name of it, it was probably uh, 25, 35, 25, 30 miles from Dachau. We were given new maps, and um, which showed uh, Dachau, and we were told that the 20th Armored were already on the road to Dachau. And our job was to take off and get to the tail end of the 20th Armored and be liaison between the 20th Armored and the infantry that would be coming down behind us in two and a half ton trucks, which is kind of idiotic, but uh, that's the way the Army was. And um, uh, the uh, reason for that was we were having a race with the 3rd Division on one side of us and the 45th Division on the other side of us, and they uh, wanted the 42nd to win the race. So we took off on the road. Um, going very tactfully, as we usually do, if we came to a, a, a tree or, you know, a, a woods or a village, we would stop and, and, uh, and reconnoiter and find out, you know, if it was okay to go through without getting killed. And, um, and we kept getting pushed on the radio. Where are you? What are your grid coordinates? And what's taking you so long? We're going to lose the race. After a while of this kind of nonsense, uh, Lieutenant Short stopped us and he said, we have to make a choice. Either we're going to have to step on the gas and go like hell and let surprise be uh, on our side, or we're going to lose the race and then everybody is going to get mad at us. So we decided to step on the gas and go like hell, which is what we did. In the process, we ran into a whole lot of little hornet's nests. Um, it would have made a movie that you wouldn't have believed anyway. Um, and for example, we cut a German convoy in half that was going across a, a, a road that we were on. Uh, firing as we went through, they didn't know what, what happened because we weren't supposed to be there. And uh, they were driving off the road. We did the same thing uh, with another uh, Convoy was going on a road going in the opposite direction, with the parallel to ours, and we just fired on them as we went. Uh, we came upon a village, uh, and somebody fired on us, and we uh, went up on a small knoll uh, next to the road, and we dragged all the junk we had accumulated in the bottom of our jeeps, like uh, bazookas and mortars and stuff like that. And we fired on them, and they probably thought they hit the front of a division or something. Not, could, no way they could assume that it was only 28 men. And um, uh, Lieutenant Short uh, stood up, and uh, this is, honest to God, this, he actually said this, three men assault the town. And we, uh, three of us went in, uh, Larry, myself, and Howard Hughes, that's his real name, great BAR man, Browning Automatic Rifle. And we cleared the first few houses and went in, waved the rest of the guys in, and we accumulated, I don't know, 160, 70, 80 uh, prisoners who looked around expecting to find more than we, more than us. And um, we broke up their weapons, told them to put their hands on their heads and walk back up the road. They looked at us like we were crazy. We looked back like we weren't. 
Um, uh, we went through another village and a German fired a Panzerfaust, which is like a German bazooka. And it landed on the other side of us and blew us out of the jeep. And we uh, dispatched him uh, quickly. And um, we uh, got back in the jeep and took off again. And these are the kinds of things that happened on the way to Dachau. When we, when we got close to Dachau, you see there are a lot of smells in war. You smell the death smell all the time. But it's usually farm animals who were rotting in the fields, who were killed because of strafing or bombing or whatever. And as we got closer to Dachau, we got this awful smell and we assumed that it was farm animals that, that we were going to pass a farm or whatever. Um, and um, we uh, finally got to the outskirts of Dachau and were pinned down. Dachau was a favorite camp of the Germans. That was their first major camp. Uh, and it was in Germany. And um, um, they didn't want to give it up. The other camps were walkovers. The Germans just left and that was it. But the, um, in this case at Dachau, they didn't want to give it up too easily. There were a lot of SS guys around. They were dropping some SS on us um, and uh, a lot of snipers. And at one point, a, an American tank came out of Dachau and we were stuck in the ditch at that point, and we stood up uh, and realized we made a mistake when the gun came down on us. Uh, but at that instant, an American tank destroyer came up behind us and blew the tank away. Um, it happened to be an American tank that had been captured by the Germans, and the guys in the tank destroyer knew that it that we didn't have any tanks in there, and uh, so therefore it had to be a captured tank. Um, I kissed the tank destroyer that day. Um, at that point, um, they told us to clean out the snipers, and um, uh, they proceeded to go into the camp. Um, and uh, at the outskirts of that camp, we went into a house. We banged on it. It was like a little small farm on the outskirts. and. Um, um, the door opened, and there was a mother, a father, a daughter, and a dog. The mother had buck teeth. The father had buck teeth. The daughter had buck teeth. And when I looked down and saw that the dog had buck teeth, I was just hysterical. It was the funniest sight. I was tense, you know. <laughs> and I could use anything at that point for a while. And, um, of course, the other guys looked at me like I was nuts. Anyway, um, we did find some snipers. One we did away with, uh, who was firing out of a house nearby. And we, after we silenced him, we went up to see who it was. And he was 11 or 12 years old, one of the Hitler youth, who were actually worse than the SS of Cape. They were just so brainwashed that, uh, that the, but we ran into a lot of those kids in their short pants. And um, um, at the, on, a, on a siding, you saw pictures of it in the slides, on the siding outside of the camp, adjacent to the camp, there were actually 40 boxcars of bodies. And we found one man alive in that 40. There's, this is about that gal, and there's some pictures, and, and there's pictures of the of the, um, the one man, I don't know ever whether he survived or not. Um, and um, it was, uh, the prisoners were just walking skeletons and they just dropped where they were and died. Um, and uh, there were piles of bodies of bodies that had been gassed and ready for the <coughs> ovens. Some of them still lit um, because they were those boxcars were brought to Dachau to uh, burn those bodies. <clears throat> and um, um, the, um, it was a total mess. And the smell was not a farm, it was Dachau. We had smelled miles before we got there. Um, and yet the people in the village who were right next to the camp said they didn't know what was going on. Um, and the, um, 
people in Munich, which was actually only nine miles from Dachau, didn't know what was going on. Now, if you want to believe that I have the, the Brooklyn Bridge is still for sale. Um, and uh, that is about as much as I can tell you right now. And you, you can ask questions later if you like. Anybody? Thanks, hey, Richard. <clears throat> Um, I didn't get to Dachau during the war, but uh, Al and I went back uh, last uh, October. We made a tour of Best Home, went to uh, Luxembourg City, then we went out to the Ham Cemetery, which is an American, uh, all American troops buried there, the ones that got killed in the, in the Ardennes. Uh, also General Patton is buried there too. They wanted to bury him in front of the troops, but he said, no, I'll go behind him. I don't belong up front. It's a beautiful cemetery. But anyway, uh, we did go to Nuremberg, and then we took a tour of Munich, and while we were there, we went out to Dachau. Today it's a museum. Some of the buildings are there, a lot of the buildings they took out. Um, they got a big museum there too, and they, we visited the uh, the uh, buildings where the uh, prisoners had slept. Originally there were uh, plywood bunk beds, two, and then there'd be a separation, but they had so many there, they shoved them all together, it'd be hundreds and hundreds in one building. They still had the ovens, uh, still there. They couldn't burn the people fast enough for the one they had, it would only have three or four ovens, so they built a new building new building is down in the back of it and there was four or five uh, ovens in there where they burned them. Uh, the other building they had was uh, they built that and they made it what they call a gas chamber out of it. They had vents in the ceiling where they put the gas. But after they built it, they never did gas anybody in back out. Instead they hung them off the rafters. So they were trying to show the public how nice people they were, and they didn't guess anybody if they did that. The torture chambers are all there. The, uh, you wouldn't believe the, uh, this, uh, some of the places and, and what these people went through. And then we went through the museum. But you saw the picture of the gate. That's still there. And as we were getting ready to leave and coming out the gate, there is a concrete box, it's probably as big as that table, maybe that high. In that is the ashes of all the people that the American troops scraped out of those ovens. And that's the living uh, monument to the last group that had been burned in Dachau. Thank you, Doug. Dachau was, Dachau was one of the larger camps. Uh, the regiment I was with, the 359th, uh, took a smaller camp called Flossenburg. It's near Wieden, Germany. And two years ago, I went back there on a tour and with the division that I was with, and we stopped there. That was a minor camp. Uh, they had... Uh, one of the men with us or that we met just before we went in there was 15 years old. No, he wasn't 15, he was younger. About 10 years old when the uh, American troops were coming in and the Germans were killing the people. Uh, he hid in a uh, culvert and they found him. And today he's a doctor in New York City. Uh, that was one of the minor camps. Also, they had just a few ovens there, and they would cremate the people. Instead of burying the ashes or getting rid of it, they opened the back door and dumped it down the back of the hill. Uh, that's the only uh, one that I... And then from there, we went to Dachau. We saw it, but it's all cleaned up today, as uh, Doug said. Uh, when we would take a town, it was a fairly large town. They usually had a manufacturing plant there. 
and adjacent to the manufacturing <coughs> plant would be a fenced in uh, place with barracks and they would keep slave labor laborers in there and believe me they weren't much better off than the people in the concentration camps. Thank Sometimes you. Uh, somebody asked me if if I know of any that survived or if I met any prisoners or whatever. And it just so happens that um, while we were scuffling with the SS troops in camp, um, two Greek, two young Greek boys who were Jewish kids from Greece who had been sent to Dachau, um, uh, and I don't know why, I don't know the only thing they would probably do there is work a little bit because they, they were still in fair, fair shape. And uh, we found them walking, they just walked out of the camp and they were walking down the road and we, uh, we found them. And we adopted them and I was the skinniest guy in the platoon at the time so uh, they got most of my clothes. And uh, we took them back to Sergeant Sadowski who was our mess sergeant and he was a he was drunk all the time, but he was a great guy. And he says, give them to me, I'll work them in the kitchen. Which is, you know, nonsense. He didn't work them, he just fed them all day long. And um, uh, they were great kids. Um, and um, at the end of the war, which was close, because this was April 29th, we found them, and May 6th or 7th or whatever it was, the war was over. Uh, 8th, thank you, who said that? Anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, the um, uh, the Rainbow Division came out with a big map in color, and the, if you follow the rainbow, that was the route that we took from Marseille on through to the end of the war, right up into the Brenner Pass. And um, uh, Marcel, one of the kids, Marcel Levy, uh, got a hold of one of the maps, and he had us all signed it, all of the guys in our platoon. And uh, I had nicknamed Marcel Baby, because to me he was a baby. I was, well, I was all of 19 then. And, um, and I called him Baby, and, um, because I really couldn't, didn't even know his name at that time. I didn't check it out. And um, uh, uh, in 1995, at a reunion, one of the guys, Sid Schaffner, went to a wedding in Israel. And he had been in constant touch with Marcel. I didn't even know it. Um, but somehow he got in touch with him. The other kid died in Canada. Marcel made it to Israel. And when Sid was there, um, he looked up Marcel, who had just sold his business, just retired. He had a lovely family, and he was invited to, to Marcel's house for dinner. And just after the dinner was over and they were having dessert, Marcel disappeared for a few minutes. And he came out with the map. And he put it on the table and he pointed to every name on that map. And if he knew the nickname, he said the nickname. And Sid said when he pointed to my name, he said, how's the baby? Um, I said to Sid, did you get a copy of that? He said, no, I didn't think of it. I said, some real estate man you are. I thought you had a couple of brains left. He says, I'll get it. So eventually he did get it. It was too big to make in one shot. So it had to be in four pieces, and it was a lousy copy. But I could still make out most of the names. Um, and it was, a, it was a kind of a kick to get that piece of paper after the war was over. I want to uh, point out that uh both Richard, who just spoke, and Al are Jewish Americans. And uh, Richard, of course, was the one who went into Dachau, and Al went back. And uh, I guess I'd like to ask a question that I'm sure a lot of students would ask if they had the time. I've got about three minutes before I wanted to come up and meet you personally and talk with you. But uh, what kind of feelings did you feel then as a Jew, liberating these places? And then going back and seeing these places, and meeting the German people again, what kinds of feelings do you have? I never went back and I don't intend to. I don't feel like I want to. Um, um, 
but uh, it is almost impossible to describe the feelings. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I'm not going to try. But but um, um, when you looked around, um, see some of these tough soldiers were throwing up and crying all over the place. It is not possible to really describe the number of feelings you get when you walk into something like that. Because that's, that's a, it's a scene that you can't... Uh, that we, first of all, nobody ever told us about the camp. We had no idea what a concentration camp was. We were going to Dachau, period. It was another village as far as we were concerned. And that's kind of a shock to get all at one time. Like Richard said, we didn't know anything about concentration camps while we were fighting. Uh, we, some of the, uh, when we take a town in Germany, uh, you're supposed to, if you're going to use the uh, house to sleep in at night, you had to put all the civilians down. And it was amazing. If they gave you a hard time, you'd tell them that the Russians are coming, and you see the fear on their faces. Uh, they were more afraid of them than they were of us. But as far as uh, the concentration camps, we didn't know anything about it uh, until almost the end of the war, practically the end of the war. Uh, one, one thing Richard uh, mentioned about fighting the Hitler Youth, uh, they were they were harder to fight against than the, Ger the old German troops because they were smart enough to put, a, put their hands up if they were cornered, but not these kids. Uh, we set up our gun one time outside of a farmhouse and they brought up an uh, anti-tank gun. And when I went out to the gun to pull my two hours or hour on the gu guard, uh, there was a lieutenant there and he had a Hitler Youth kid, it must have been about 10, 11 years old, and he was crying like hell. And the lieutenant's laughing. I said, what's the matter? He says, these two, we picked up these two, and one of them, they both clicked their heels when Heil Hitler, one of them said he wanted to die for the Fuhrer. So I obliged him. He said, this one changed his mind. So with that, there was a log lying there. The lieutenant sat down there, grabbed the kid, put him over his knee, and beat the heck out of him. And they sent him back to a PW stockade. But that's what, that's what we were fighting at the tail end. And that was worse than anything. Um, do you have anything to add? Anything to add to that? The German people today, I mean, we're going to talk about Nuremberg in a few minutes, but... Oh, German, well, I have, I, I have a lot of German, I have German French. Right. I have no problem with it. Um, and, and I, I have a nice talk. Um, and uh, we had one guy, Fritz Krentler, uh, who was part of our, he came, he came over as a replacement. And I had to go to, um, I had to go to pick him up at the headquarters. And I saw this guy that looked German. He still had an accent. He sounded German. Uh, and his name, was French Kre Fritz Krentler, was definitely German. And um, I called his name, and he got, I came out of the truck, and I got him in the Jeep, and I'm taking him back to the, to, um, to the platoon. And, and he said to me, um, I said to him, are you in the wrong army? And he said, no. He said, my father got us out the last ones to get out of Germany. I went to school, they drafted me, and I'm back over here. He says, I can't shoot at these people. I have relatives here. What am I supposed to do? I said, don't worry about it. Things come naturally. The next day we got into a firefight. He couldn't wait to kill Germans. <laughs> Did they shoot at me? I'll shoot back. Incidentally, his picture is right over here. The bottom picture on this thing here is part of, part of the platoon. Um, and Fritz is the one to the right of me, standing in front of a bunch of German prisoners, if you ever get up here. Um, and um, uh, the, I, have, I don't have any problem with it. Um, and I don't know anybody that does. 
The war's been over a long time. Uh, speaking about uh, the German people today, we, uh, of course, when we went back, it was only a little over a month since 911 in New York. So uh, everybody was telling us, you'll be careful on the plane, you'll be careful when you go here, go there. And don't identify yourself to anybody. So, of course, when we went to uh, Luxembourg City, we were wearing our baseball caps that says the Battle of the Bulge. So uh, we got ready to go up to uh, Nuremberg, and uh, we put the uh, caps in our luggage so that we wouldn't be identified as being veterans from the Battle of the Bulge. Well, we get to Nuremberg, we get off the train. Everybody, the kids are wearing, God bless the USA, sweatshirt. We love the USA. Everybody's dressed in, and here we are afraid to put a cap on. But that's how it's changed over there. The people are more friendly. Uh, we didn't have any problems at all. Except uh, getting out to catch the train that we missed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm going to pause right now for the next three minutes. Welcome back. My name is Matthew Rosell. I teach history at Hudson Falls Senior High School in Hudson Falls, New York. We're broadcasting live over the internet. This is the World War II Living History Project. Our mission is to uh, interview veterans and bring them together with students so that our past will never be forgotten and our future can be preserved. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about World War II. Specifically, uh, we're going to talk about the end of World War II uh, in this last segment, which is going to last for about a half an hour. Then we're going to give our students an opportunity to come up and uh, meet our veterans here today and see some of the artifacts that they brought in and uh, have the uh, veterans explain them. Uh, so I'd like to start by introducing our veterans who are with us today. Uh, gentlemen, if you just give a wave of the hand, I have Mr. Doug Vink from Albany, Mr. Richard Merowitz from Albany, uh, Mr. Al Cohen, who's also from Albany, and Mr. Ray Keats, who's from Hudson Falls, New York. And these gentlemen are survivors of the Battle of the Bulge, one of the uh, most horrific battles in American history. They made it through, they pushed on into Germany, and they were there when the Germans surrendered at the end of, well, the beginning of May, 1945. It was May 8th, right? May 8th. Who can forget that day? VE Day in Europe. Uh, the first segment of our program, we heard about the Battle of the Bulge. Last period, the second segment, we talked about the liberation of the death camps, in particular the one at Dachau, near Munich, Germany. In this period, we're going to delve into the end of the war again and what happened afterwards, with particular focus on the Nuremberg Tribunals. So we're going to start this slideshow right now. And uh, I'm going to walk you through a description. This is done by Kyle Getty, one of my students, and myself. And uh, what do you do? with these Nazis? What do you do after these crimes once the war is over? These are the questions that had to be answered. And they were answered and precedents were set. The Nuremberg Tribunals, the precedent for the punishment of war crimes and crimes against humanity. At the conclusion of World War II, the Allied powers set up an international military tribunal to punish high-ranking Nazis responsible for atrocities committed during the war. The Allied powers appointed judges and supplied prosecutors. The trials began November 1945. Twelve separate trials would be conducted involving hundreds of Nazi defendants and thousands of witnesses. They would last until 1949. A lot of people don't realize that. It was more than one trial, and they lasted for it at least four years. Chief U.S. Counsel Justice Robert Jackson's opening statement, the wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. From the dock, a view of the uh, defendants from the first trial, back it up one. Uh, we see the military police, EMPs, and uh, 
surrounding them the white helmets we see some of the interpreters and we see the uh, prisoners at the dock and I'm going to point to them right here Herman Gehring, Hitler's number two man Rudolf Hass, uh, Deputy Fuhrer and about a dozen others this is Gehring Go ahead. the indictment charges one, conspiracy to wage war, excuse me, aggressive war, crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity. First trial. The trials pitted defendants against defendants. Some cooperated while some were very difficult to question and prosecute. Hermann Goering, chief of the Luftwaffe at the German Air Force and Hitler's designated successor, was the prosecution's biggest challenge. Much horrific evidence was brought forth to convict the defendants as prosecution and defense swayed for 315 total days of examinations. These American soldiers are standing watch, and it was a 24-hour suicide watch, and they peered into these uh, jail cells. And I'll point out one of these soldiers in this pretty famous photograph from Life magazine is sitting in this room today. Go ahead. Of the Nazis tried, 11 were sentenced to death by hanging. Seven were sentenced to life in prison or on lesser charges. Three were acquitted. Goring committed suicide on the eve of his scheduled execution. He felt that hanging was beneath him. He said, you can shoot me, but hanging was beneath him. So he chomped on a cyanide tablet and we'll have Al tell you about that in a minute. Trial showed that the political and military leaders could be held accountable for actions in wartime. The trials also discredited Nazi, fascist, and militarist ideologies that had caused the war by showing the br brutality of their crimes. The trials did face criticism. Some believed it was victor's vengeance and not the pursuit of justice. Others wondered how a court could be created after the acts committed had been defined as crime. Nevertheless, the standard was set so that future atrocities committed in the name of war would not go unpunished. And this shows the Hague Tribunal, which is going on right now in the Netherlands, Serbian officials being held responsible for crimes against humanity in the 1992 Bosnian War and, of course, the war in Kosovo. And it included ethnic cleansing, which is another new way of saying a holocaust. Go ahead. Okay, one more. Okay, what are we looking at here? I think I'll have uh, Al Cohen tell you who this person is. This was, <coughs> this was my ID card to get into the cell block at the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg. Um, at first, when I first got there, you didn't need a card to get in. And then the FBI had a detachment there, and they came out with this uh, ID card. Uh, and we were supposed to turn them in when we left the war trials, but I hung on to mine just for the heck of it. Next slide. And uh, you're in this picture, aren't you? On the, <coughs> on the left side, uh, I'm the third one right there. I was guarding one of the criminals. I don't recall who it was at that time, but on the uh, on the right side, the first cell was Goring. The second one, uh, I believe, was Hess, and then Yodel, and so on von Ribbentrop, and so on down the line. And. Uh I think you told me last time that you, uh, you on occasion had to take these men off for exercise? Uh, Hess, for some reason or other, uh, Hess, when, well, I'll back that up. Every morning they took them out to a little courtyard between the prison and the uh, courthouse. It was like a garden, some grass and trees. And when they took them out, 
has had to be handcuffed to someone. Why? I don't know. Maybe they're afraid that the others would try and kill him. So whenever I was on guard that time of the day, I ended up being handcuffed to him. I'd have to walk around the yard for an hour, an hour and a half with him. I have a slideshow on Rudolph Hess, if you want to bring that up. And uh, I just want to learn a little bit about who he was, and then I'll ask you some more questions. This is him. Rudolph Hess, 1894 to 1987. Do you know he lived till he was 92 years old? Deputy Fuhrer considered to be number three man in Hitler's Germany after Goering. Best known for a surprise flight to Scotland on May 10, 1941, in which he intended to negotiate peace with the British, but which resulted in his capture and long-term imprisonment. In 1923, Hess took part in Hitler's failed beer hall push in Munich, in which Hitler and the Nazis attempted to seize control of Germany. It failed. Hess was arrested in prison along with Hitler at Landsberg Prison. While in prison, which was more like a country club, I think, Hess took dictation for Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. So I got to know him very well. Go ahead. On April 21, 1933, he was made Deputy Fuhrer, a figurehead position with mostly ceremonial, ceremonial duties. He was a shy, insecure man who displayed a near religious devotion, fanatical loyalty, and absolute blind obedience to Hitler, much like the Hitler youth that these gentlemen were talking about. Here's a quote. We believe that the Fuhrer is obeying a higher call to fashion German history. There can be no criticism of, the, criticism of this belief. Hess had only one desire to serve the Fuhrer and thus lacked the will to engage in self-serving struggles for power and lost out primarily to his subordinate and eventual successor, Martin Bormann, who disappeared after the war. As a result, Hitler gradually distanced himself from Hess. And here's a photograph showing Rudolf Hess in the middle in 1935. I believe Robert Ley was also at Nuremberg. Uh, Martin Bormann, though, escaped to South America. Go ahead. Hoping to great, regain importance and redeem himself in the eyes of his Fuhrer, Hess put on a Luftwaffe uniform and flew a German fighter plane alone towards Scotland, he was an excellent flyer, on a peace mission May 10, 1941, just before the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union on June 22nd. Hess wanted to convince the British government that Hitler only wanted Lebensraum, or living space, for the German people and had no wish to destroy a fellow quote-unquote Nordic nation. Hess was declared insane by a bewildered Hitler and effectively disowned by the Nazis. His flight ultimately caused Hitler and the Nazis a huge embarrassment as they struggled to explain his actions. During his years of British imprisonment, Hess displayed increasingly unstable behavior and developed a paranoid obsession that his food was being poisoned. In 1945, Hess was returned to Germany to stand trial before the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, and that's where Hales passed across with him. In the courtroom, he suffered from spells of disorientation, staring off vacantly into space, and for a time claimed to have amnesia. In periods of lucidity, he continued to display loyalty to Hitler. And you can see from this photograph of Nuremberg, he doesn't look very good. Quote from him, his final speech at the docket. It was grant, granted for me for many years to live and work under the greatest son whom my nation has brought forth in a thousand years of its history. Even if I could, I would not expunge this peerage from my existence. I regret nothing. In spite of his mental condition, he was sentenced to life in prison. The Soviets blocked all attempts at an early release. He committed suicide in 1987 within your lifetime, people. At age 92, the last of the prisoners to be tried at Nuremberg. Okay. So, bring up that last PowerPoint. And make this big again. Okay. So, I guess I'll have the lights on again. And I'll ask Gail, what was it like to be there with these men? Actually, 18, uh, 
I was 19 years old. Uh, the war was over. They were anxious to get home. Uh, it was just another job, really. But as we got as we got older, those of us that got full guard there, it had a different meaning. It was part of history. Uh, for we pulled guard uh, for two hours on. For two hours on, we stood in front of a cell. During the day, uh, you could look in. There's a cutout in the door. You could look into the cell if they were there. They always had to be visible to you. Uh, they had a toilet there, a bed, and a table with one chair. And they always, if they used the toilet, uh, it's the only time you'd, they'd be out of your vision for how long it took. Uh, there was one window in the back of the cell, and all these criminals, well, most of the Germans, were fresh air fiends. In the spring, in the summer, it wasn't too bad. But in the winter, it was hot in the cell block where we were standing. Uh, it was freezing outside. The windows were wide open because they were fresh air fiends and you'd have to stare at them continuously to make sure they didn't try and commit suicide and that cold air would blow in your face and it was a rough job trying to stay awake. Uh, two hours on and then two hours off and they had one room, it used to be a gymnasium, they had the cots set up, we could lay down and rest, some of the fellows played cards were red. Um, the same room is the room that they cleaned out and they built the scaffolds to hang them. Uh, the second tier, uh, they kept the most important ones on the first tier, that's the ground floor, uh, like uh, Julius Stryker, uh, Yodel, uh, Von Ribbentrop, all of the 20, I believe it's 20 or 21 most important ones. The second tier, there was a catwalk, and it was, the, the flooring was like a piece of tin. Every time you walked, it would bounce up and down. You had four or five cells to watch. Um, the uh, less important uh, criminals were kept there third tier were witnesses and some of the criminals. Among the ones on the uh, top floor was Elsa something. She was a notorious guard at one of the camps and she would take the skin off of the prisoners when they were killed if they had a tattoo or something and she would make lampshades out of them and all kinds of decorative ornaments. Um, when you, the third tier that she was on, you'd have to look, watch them the same way. You had to make sure that they didn't try and kill themselves. She was a cute one. When she heard the guard coming, she would take her clothes off and stand there naked. You had to look into the cell. So what happened? You'd have to look. And she would write a letter to the commanding colonel, commanding officer of the prison. And the first thing you know, they'd end up, you're on the carpet for looking at her. But after a while, I guess they got used to it. And that was the same with a few others. Um, during, at night, if you see that there's a, like a grating with a light on the side of each cell, Right, the light. the light and that, it went over the cutout in the door and that light shone into the cell continuously. Uh, I pulled that guard, that kind of guard for three or four months and one day we got back to our barracks and we fell out, the first sergeant read off the day's schedule and he came over he wanted a volunteer 
and no radio man. He needed a radio man. So nobody raised their hands. Nobody volunteered for anything. So he came over to me. He said, what do you know about a radio? I said, I know how to turn it on and off. He said, good. He said, get cleaned up, get a Jeep, get down to the police station. The police station was adjoining the prison. So I get down there, and I had to see some lieutenant. And he asked me the same question, so I gave him the same answer. So he said, good, you'll be radio man here. While patrolling Nuremberg, they had anywhere from 20 to 30 jeeps patrolling the town what day and night. So I became a radio operator for about four months, and that was real easy. Then I went back to guarding the prisoners uh, for about a week. And after that, I became a, um, they called him an escort guard. I wore a white helmet and a white belt. And I would take them up to the summary courts. They had uh, lawyers from uh, Russia, France, all the different countries. And they would interrogate some of these uh, prisoners. And it was amazing, some of the stories that they heard. One of them was how the... Uh, they provoked uh, Poland into a, a situation. They sent over German troops dressed as civilians, and they fired back across the border at the German troops over there. And that's how they started the incidents that started the war. It was things like that that were very interesting. Uh, finally, in June, the beginning of June of 46, they came around with a deal. Um, if you wanted to sign up for six months to stay at the war trials, they would fly you back to the States for 30 days and then you'd have to go back. The reason for that was uh, the fellows that had the decorations and the combat badges uh, were being shipped home and they wanted to put on a show for the other countries, so they wanted combat troops to pull guard. But it didn't work. Most of us went home. That's, that's very interesting. And uh, this photograph, do you remember the day it was taken at all? Or? It's a pretty famous photograph. It, it was in, the, uh, in Life magazine, January of 40... I think I put the date on 46. 46. Yeah. I didn't know anything about it. It happened that my wife, well, she was my friend, a friend of mine, went to the dentist and sitting in the uh, waiting room. She was looking through Life magazine and she found it. Oh, thanks a lot. Now we have about... Uh, seven or eight minutes, and uh, then I'm going to stop so that you can come up and see some of the artifacts and meet these gentlemen for yourself and ask some, some more specific questions. Uh, but Richard uh, Barrow has brought an unusual artifact today. It's one that's uh, getting him a lot of attention these days, although when he picked it up, uh, I don't think he thought too much of it. And uh, I just want to ask Richard before he's talks a little bit about it. We have a couple pictures of him. But is it true that Adolf Hitler killed himself on the 30th of April because he found out that a 19-year-old Jewish kid from Brooklyn was using his hat as a frisbee? <laughs> no. No. He committed suicide because he found out this Jewish kid stomped on his favorite hat. <laughs> um, Tell us the story. Um, the morning after we took Deck out, um, to the, we were called into the command post again. Um, and um, there were two German civilians, big husky guys, who apparently were um, spies for us. They were filtering that information uh, from Munich. Uh, the, town, the townspeople wanted to give up. They didn't want any more damage. The war was near an end. Um, 
And just so the town had not been taken yet, it would, was taken later on that day, uh, they knew where Hitler's house was, and um, they were to lead us into where his house was uh, to search it and see if we could get any intelligence. So one, we asked them who was in there, and they said only SS snipers. And um, um, we went into the town, only one squad, three jeeps, 12 men, and these two cuckoos. And they said if we got into any trouble, uh, some fellows with white armbands would jump out of the woodwork and give us a hand. We got into Munich. It was uh, very weird. It was very quiet. Looked like a deserted town. Everybody was hiding. Um, we, all the bridges were blown and we had to get to the other side of this river that goes through Munich to get to Hitler's house. There were stairs that led up to, very high stairs, it led up to a footbridge that went across the river, uh, which was just wide enough for a cheek. So we put it in low, low, four-wheel drive and went up the stairs, across the footbridge, footbridge and down the other side and got to Hitler's house. It was in a it was a small apartment house. And um, this place, uh, even though it wasn't the most gorgeous thing in the world, was where he had uh, met with Chamberlain and all these other diction di uh, dignitaries. Uh, and it was not too far from where his main offices were. Munich were, was, was his, his favorite place. And we banged on the door, and it was opened by a, he had an English housekeeper tall, stately lady with pepper and salt hair who called us ruffians. And why was everybody so mad at Mr. Hitler? He was such a fine man. <laughs> and one of my buddies, Herb Herman, told me, he says, I'm throwing her down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, let's just get into this place and do what we have to do and get the hell out of here. And this is what we did. I, we all ran into different rooms. I ran into a bedroom, which turned out to be his. I opened all the drawers, and his personal stuff was gone. There was a closet, which I opened, and that was empty. I saw something dark on an upper shelf. I dragged over a chair, reached up, and grabbed this gorgeous top hat. Looked inside and saw his initials, A-H, in big gold letters. I swear to you, I could see his head in the hat. I was still kind of mad. I cleaned that one up. From um, the day before, I threw it on the floor, jumped off the chair onto the hat, and smashed it. And um, I am told by Herb that I walked out of the bedroom with his hat on, strutting around like Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> uh, I don't remember that. Um, <clears throat> Sometime later, um, after the war was over, uh, word got to division headquarters and um, that some ding-dong had Hitler's hat and the general sent them a photographer down to take a picture of it. The picture on top uh, is in the division history book with uh, a comb under my nose and the hat on doing the Hitler thing. I was 19 there. Yeah, it laid in the basement. It was in the bottom of my duffel bag until I got home. Uh, when I got home, I took it out of the bag, put it in a paper bag, and threw it in the bottom of the cabinet where it laid for about 50 years. In 1993, uh, my, the guys in my unit found me uh, and they called me, and I went to a reunion, and the first thing they said when they saw me was, did you bring the hat? And I really didn't think about the hat. In 1995 is when it came out. I brought it to a reunion, and the reunion that year was in Seattle, Washington, uh, so that the guys could have fun with it, and they all walked around the lobby with the hat on, and the comb under their nose, um, <laughs> taking pictures of each other. And the reason I brought it out is because I knew it was going to go to a um, museum in Washington, and I didn't know how long it was going to be there. Anyway, a young, talented fellow who makes documentaries by the name of Jeff Krulik saw it in the museum um, and uh, 
uh, got a hold of the curator, and, got, and the curator called me, and he said, this guy wants to make a documentary of this story. Uh, can I give him your number? And I said, yes. Um, so he showed up at a um, reunion a couple of years ago with a crew, and they, they shot a lot of stuff. And he is, it should be finished this month. It has been to a couple of preliminary film festivals. When it's completely polished, it'll go to more. Uh, it's called Hitler's Hat. Click on his hat. Click on Hitler's Hat. The other one. <laughs> You're talking, oh, yeah. this is, this oh is sorry, this is the website. This is the website, hickershat.com. <laughs> and um, um, so you'll read more about it. And if you see at some time in the future Hitler's hat, probably in the History Channel or Discovery or National Public Radio Television or whatever, um, you may get a kick out of it because he has a habit of making some, taking some, putting some humor in all his documentaries, even though it's it's kind of weird. I have a a shrunken version of one of the um, posters. Hold on, just a second. Vice man. That's awesome. And. <laughs> This is it. Here's the solution. Good for you. Uh -huh. It was it was pretty good looking hat. It's still not too bad considering all these years and the way I murder it. <laughs> um, but uh, that's it. Why is it in a museum right now? Why? Why isn't it? Yeah. Well, there was one uh, back in November, in December, January downtown, and I have. Um, there was talk that the. Um, um, there was talk that the Holocaust Museum wanted it, and may still want it, but I um, found that it gets an awful lot of attention going around to the schools and churches and synagogues, and um, and it's actually uh, ruining the hat even worse than it was before. But I think it's kind of more important to get the attention, and um, so that people will uh, remember. What's happened in the past, I hope, and try and avoid these things again, although not too successfully, not with the look around of what goes on in Africa and Bosnia and, and everywhere else as far as uh, their own little holocausts are concerned. So uh, just remember what happened, please, and try to keep it from happening again. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I think that's the most important message, and that's why we do this. And uh, did you get the message today from this presentation from by these gentlemen? I think so. Um, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for coming up, and uh, why don't you take a couple minutes and come on up and see the hat and meet our events again.